Um, well, let's move on then. Um, we will we we will move on to our speaker tonight. Um, I'll start off by saying this: there are there are advantages and disadvantages to Zoom technology. Um, one disadvantage is that we don't get together and share face to face fellowship and food. Uh, one advantage, though, is that we can broaden our speaker list. They don't have to drive all the way to Tallahassee to speak to us. I've wanted to have Professor James M. Denham, Mike Denham, as his friends know him, um, Professor of History and Director of the Lawton M. Childs Jr. Center for Florida History at Florida Southern College, speak to us for some time. That's a mouthful. Um, Zoom has now made that possible. It's not just that he is a very fine historian, the author of uh, such books as Rogue's Paradise, uh, Crime and Punishment um, on the Florida Frontier, 1821 to 1861, a really fun book, by the way, um, or, or um, Florida founder William P. Duval, frontier bon vivant, and Florida's first uh, civilian territorial governor. It's, uh, it's also not just that he is uh, a member of the Tallahassee Historical Society Bicentennial Committee, planning along with Dr. Larry Rivers, who will be speaking to us in April, a major symposium for Tallahassee's 2024 <coughs> bicentennial. These are all good reasons. An additional one, however, is that he is part of a tradition that I would like to resuscitate. You see, Mike spoke to us once before in the early 1980s as a Callow graduate student of two of our most prestigious presidents, Jay Leach Wright and William Warren Rogers, both professors in the FSU history department. I very, very much want to strengthen our ties to Tallahassee and Florida's institutions of higher learning. I really like the idea of historians sending their most promising graduate students to speak to us. It allows us to hear the newest voices in the history field, and it allows those students the experience of presenting their research to a receptive audience. Mike is a shining example of how the Tallahassee Historical Society can actually make a person's career. Without that first talk back in 1983, he would be nothing. <laughs> so having said all of that, I am pleased to announce um, the return of Mike Denham. Mike. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. I appreciate it. It's, um, um, I'm glad I didn't see all those questions because I'm not sure that I could have, could have, um, could have answered those questions. Can you see me? We can. Okay. Can you, uh, okay. Cause all I see is Bob is you and, and it's not a very flattering picture. It uh, never is. <laughs> Uh, okay, well, I'll, if, if you can see me, that's, that's fine. I mean, I, that's, that's really all I can hope for, I guess. Um, can everybody, can everybody see Mike? Yeah, we can see you, Mike. All right. All right. Okay, good. Um, yes. um, um, I'm, I'm really, I'm really pleased to be here. And as Bob mentioned, of course, this is really kind of cool for me because about 40 years ago, um, I did my first academic paper and I was really nervous. It was at the RA Gray Building and Lee Wright actually invited me to, to do this uh, presentation. And um, it was on the Reed Alston duel. Many of you will know uh, that story, which occurred in 1830 or 1839. Um, and it was, a, it was quite, a, quite a fun uh, uh, graduate paper for me to write. And, um, and it was actually turned out to be my first my first publication. So actually my second publication because my first publication was in Appalachia, um, which occurred uh, a few, about a year earlier. 
But anyway, what I want to do tonight is to talk a little bit about um, a guy that I've been um, very friendly with for about 30 years. Um, and that is a person that I discovered uh, all the way back in graduate school. And I um, always thought maybe, you know, maybe I could write something about him. Um, and that's William Pope Duvall. Um, William Pope Duvall was, um, let me see if I can get this thing to share. Are you, are you seeing um, William Pope Duvall's picture there? Am I, am I doing this right? Okay. Let's see, view, gallery view. Um, there's a share screen. Yeah, hover over the bottom of your screen. There should be a share screen. I'm just not seeing the, the share screen thing. Um, let's see. Oh, there we go. Okay. Now you can see it, I bet, right? Yeah, yeah, we can see it. Okay, good. Wonderful. Okay. Um, this actually is a dust jacket of the book that I did in 2015. It took me, you know, quite some time, um, about 30 years off, off and on of, of, of doing research and writing. And um, obviously, I knew the general outlines of Duval's life in, in, in Florida and Tallahassee. But what I, what I soon discovered was that he was very much connected to the national scene. And um, in thinking about things to share with you tonight, I thought about well, how can I approach this? Well, it's too not enough time to really do the whole story. So what I thought is we'd have a little fun. Um, one of my um, favorite movies um, is, of course, Forrest Gump. Everybody knows Forrest Gump, right? Forrest Gump, of course, was the uh, person who was involved in everything. Of course, he 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 met uh, he met President Kennedy. Um, there he is with President Kennedy, right? Um, he met Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson is giving him a, a, an award there, um, probably a Medal of Honor because he was in Vietnam, of course. And what I thought is a funny, kind of a fun motif. And again, you're seeing that, aren't you? Are you aren't you seeing LBJ? Yes. Okay, good. Um, what I thought would be a kind of a neat thing to do is to take Duval and take him through early American history um, in his first um, leavings of, of Richmond, Virginia. This is actually a, an image of Richmond, Virginia. Um, uh, about the time that, du well, probably after Duval was born. Duval was actually born in 1784. He was born um, one year after the signing of the peace treaty that ended the American Revolution. So he was a little boy, of course, growing up in the immediate post-revolutionary period in Richmond, Virginia. His father was a very well-to-do um, figure. This is a picture of his father in old age. His father lived to be nearly 100. Um, he actually was a, um, a friend of George Washington. He fought in the American Revolution. He actually was uh, quite well known to George Washington. There are actually some letters um, in George Washington's collection that he wrote to, uh, to, to Mayor Duval, who also was known as Major. Uh, Duval. Um, and um, he, of course, obviously was, was quite a leading figure. And one of the things in, in Richmond, and one of the things that this pre precocious little boy was supposed to have done, that is the son of, 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 of the senior William Pope Duval, was, according to the account given by um, Washington Irving, Washington Irving, of course, um, we're going to talk a little bit about Washington Irving. Washington Irving's wrote a series of stories, actually, with using uh, Duval as the uh, as the subject. Um, Duval was a, was an amazingly um, um, precocious kid, and then, of, of course, in his later years, he loved to tell tall tales. Um, and part of the fun of writing this biography was to try to figure out how Duval and Washington Irving first met. Um, we think they met in 1808, and I'll talk about that a little bit, during one of the most spectacular trials in American history, but I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. What I was basically mentioning, or at least intimating, is that Duval's life, uh, which is a kind of larger than, larger than life life, was actually depicted in a lot of um, uh, Washington Irving stories. Um, a lot of the stories are embellished. 
Um, but we think that he actually gained these stories from Duval without really knowing, without Duval really knowing it. And then by about 1840, he took a lot of these stories and a lot of these notes that he had taken and published uh, various, various stories, short stories about Duval. So Duval's stories have come down to us um, through the writing of probably America's greatest literary figure of the time, and that's Washington Irving. Anyway, let's go a little further here. Um, Duval uh, was a kind of a scion of the Virginia dynasty. Everybody knows the Virginia dynasty. Um, there's Jefferson, Madison, Monroe. Of course, I, I don't have Washington in there. I need to put Washington in there. But this was the world that Duval's family came from. Um, and they're all really well connected. They all know Major Duval and, Duval, and, and the younger Duval will be fortunate in, ha in having these individuals as well, I guess you'd say patrons. And we all know the Virginians, of course, looked after each other. They were very much um, uh, always looking after each other. Um, and there's no question that this was the case with, with Duval. Well, this map is a map from Virginia. Actually, uh, here's Richmond. We can pick up the Cumberland Gap Trail here from Richmond to Roanoke. And then, of course, through the the Cumberland Gap. As a 15 year old boy or so, um, Duval joined this huge processional um, from, from Virginia to Virginia's sister state, or I should say daughter state of Kentucky. Um, he ended up of course here uh, in the Hines Fort Bardstown area um, where he took his father's name, his reputation with his older brother his older brother was about 20, Duval was about 14, um, and he and his older brother went to Kentucky, and it wasn't long before his older brother um, wait, uh, took all the money, took all the, the property that they'd taken with him, um, drank it off or, or gambled it away or whatever, and then Duval, of course, was kind of left to fend for himself here. In, in so, but he had... But he had um, he had a name, he had his father's uh, name, and he also had his father's um, land warrants that he had gained and uh, get, gained from, um, from his service in the American Revolution. And all of the revolutionary veterans, of course, were given huge tracts of land um, in Kentucky. And that's really what Duval was uh, and his brother were doing out there. Well, um, he gets married, of course, to a woman named Nancy Hines. She's the prettiest uh, girl in Bardstown, Kentucky. Um, there's a, a wonderful story, of course, of, 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 of uh, Washington Irving telling about the day they met um, and so forth in Bardstown, Kentucky and so forth. And they, they end up getting married. And he ends up, of course, leaving the woods and, and, uh, and, and, and reading law and then eventually becomes a lawyer. And in 1808, he um, attends the most famous trial in America, um, the trial of the century, the trial of the time, the day, the, the time, and that is the trial of Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr, of course, had been captured trying to detach the western part of the United States away from uh, America. And here is Aaron Burr here as he looked at that time. Um, and the trial, of course, is going to be presided over by John Marshall, also a Richmonder, and the prosecutor of that trial is a guy by the name of William Wirtz. Now, William Wirtz is going to have a, a really, really strong connection to Florida, and not only Florida, but of course, uh, Jefferson County. And, and we think when he would have known Duval's father um, in, in, um, in Richmond, and we think that, um, well, we think that um, also Duval met Washington Irving. This is perhaps where, where Duval met Washington Irving for the first time uh, in Richmond at this treason trial. Now, William Ward, of course, was from Maryland. He became, he was a very skilled lawyer. He was the longest serving attorney general. He ended up being the longest uh, uh, attending serving attorney general in American history. He became attorney general under James Monroe and then continued that, continued that service um, under uh, John Quincy Adams. 
So in words, Duval had yet another uh, uh, interesting friend that he could that he could um, use as a kind of mentor. Now another person who kind of comes into the picture here is a woman that Wirt married, who was known, who was who was called um, Elizabeth Washington Gamble Wirt. William Wirt married her, and of course we all all the people there in in the room. Uh, know that name, Gamble. Is she related to John Gamble? Yes, um, absolutely. And that's another name that would eventually, within a couple of decades, <clears throat> um, they would, of course, that name would be very much involved in middle Florida uh, and the land boom that took place. Now we're kind of projecting ahead here. Duval is not government yet, but William Wirt um, and his wife invested heavily in lands in Tallahassee in the 1820s. Uh, and the person who helped them sketch out those lands, of course, was would be Governor Duval. Duval but we don't want to move too quickly uh, because he's not governor yet. Another person that Duval met who would be a life, lifetime friend was this individual, someone who's not really well known today, but someone who also was a very, very key figure in early American history. And his name is Samuel Souther, who was a native of New Jersey. Um, but during the 1808 period, um, during the Burr trial, he was in Virginia uh, uh, reading law, practicing law, um, and Duval would also make an acquaintance with him. He would serve as Secretary of the Navy um, under um, James Monroe, and then of course also under John Quincy Adams. So he and Duval would be lifetime friends. And I was actually able to discover about 15 or 20 letters in the collection of Southards uh, uh, at Princeton University. Uh, and these were incredibly rich descriptions um, of the local scene in Tallahassee that Duval wrote to him in the very early years, the early 1820s um, or middle 1820s. And I will, I'll get back to that a little bit because Southard, like Wirtz, was very interested in finding out about land opportunities uh, in Florida. So these names, these individuals are going to kind of come together. Uh, the next figure that Duval met, who became a lifetime friend, and you would even call him perhaps a mentor, is this individual whose name is John C. Calhoun. Um, John C. Calhoun was in the um, 13th Congress that Duval would eventually be elected to. And he and Duval and many, uh, many other congressional members were among those who were very, very outspoken in favor of war with Great Britain. Now, Calhoun, of course, would go on to be, um, to be a, a great leader in American history. And he was very different than Duval, his personality wise, but the two of them were very, very rich friends. I guess the question is, what kind of guy was Duval? What kind of personality did he have? What was his personality like? What kind of person was he? Um, one observer who witnessed Duval's antics on the Florida frontier in later years noticed that the governor had an inexhaustible store of anecdotes with which he could amuse an audience for hours. His style of rehearsing them would provoke an outburst of mirth under any circumstances. Duval's facial expressions and body language contributed to his magnetism on the stump. While his listeners would be convulsed with laughter, the man wrote, not a muscle of his face would be moved. His face seemed mixture of earnestness, distress, complacency, with a sort of devil may care expression. And whenever the humor came over him, the very appearance of the manner was comical indeed. With all, the commentator remembered, I do not think any man was steel enough to be able to restrain himself from laughter. He sometimes made little blunders, but always had a way of making a plausible escape and frequently added to this added to his ludicrousness of the scenes he was describing, for he was all full of information. Another observer noted that as a social companion, Duval knew no equals. Whether traveling or at the fireside, Duval, who sang an admirable song and strikes upon the productions of Bobby Burns, 
who has passed an evening in his life inspiring company and has not heard him sing my, my boy Tommy or Tam O'Shanter as a man in whom dwells a superabundance of milk and human kindness, the observer continued, as a social companion, ever mirthful and enlivening, I know not as equal. Of course, Duval, of course, in Kentucky, um, rode circuit. And of course, in Kentucky, in Bardstown, which was a very famous place, really, for lawyers, it was kind of a competition in Kentucky between Bardstown and Lexington. And Lexington, of course, and, uh, was, of course, the home of Henry Clay, who was a contemporary of Duval. Um, they were on opposite ends of, of, of the spectrum. They were, they, were, they were enemies, even in the early years. And, of course, as their lives would, would, would move forward, they would, of course, clash. And a lot of that clashing had to do with their relationship, or at least Duval's relationship, um, with a man who was, was of course, uh, who would become president, and that is Andrew Jackson. Uh, more about that a little bit later. Well, Duval was part of the, uh, of the um, not only did he, he serve in the 13th Congress, 13th Congress, he also fought in the War of 1812. And this is, of course, the Indiana Territory where he served. It's just over the boundary, of course, of Kentucky. Um, and this is, of course, in, um, uh, where he served really without much distinction. Um, his campaigns were really kind of un unsuccessful, but he did, of course, serve um, um, in, that, in that conflict, only return back to Bardstown and then go to Washington. When he returned to Washington for the second time as a congressman, this is what he found. This is the Capitol, which was burned and destroyed by the British after the British had, had captured Washington or at least burned Washington. And, and so, so Duval is in that group of returning congressmen um, that, uh, that had to kind of survey the scene and, and move forward. Um, here's an image, of course, of Duval's friend, um, a young Washington Irving, who would have been about the same age as Duval. Washington Irving's brother was actually a member of Congress from New York, um, and Duval and he and his brother-in-law, a man named William Kirk Paulding, um, or James Kirk Paulding, who is, whose image is here, he, um, along with Duval, I'm sorry, along with Washington Irving, wrote uh, a lot of fiction. In fact, both Irving and Paulding, really their day jobs, the way they supported themselves was in government service, generally in the Naval Department. Paulding, of course, was very much involved in the Naval Department. And Irving, of course, was a diplomat. Uh, many of you know about Irving's tales of Alhambra. He wrote these while he was a, a diplomat, of course, in Spain. At any rate, um, this is Paulding. And of course, he wrote a very famous book called The Lion of the West. Um, a lot of people think that his character, his, 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 um, his star character in that, in that play was Davy Crockett, or at least the, the person who he is depicting uh, Davy, is Davy Crockett. His, his, um, his hero in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the novel or in the play is one of my great, great names in early uh, history, and that is Nimrod Wildfire. Now, I can imagine what kind of character he would have been, Nimrod Wildfire. Well, a lot of people think that Davy Crockett was the inspiration for Nimrod Wildfire, but I don't think there's any question that it was really Duval. Um, Duval was um, his, his storytelling, his character, and so forth, probably was the inspiration for Nimrod Wildfire. But anyway, there we go. Here uh, is an image of, of um, Duval's friend, John C. Calhoun, about that time. Uh, when we think of John C. Calhoun, we think, of course, of the old, grizzled, angry individual that uh, he became uh, in the 1850s. This, of course, is Calhoun as a young man, probably about the time um, he was in the House of Representatives or a little bit older. Here's an early image of, of Washington during that time. And here also is uh, the President of the United States, James Monroe. Now, back in Kentucky, Duval had experienced some, some serious economic setbacks. Uh, the Panic of 1819 um, had really created a tremendous amount of economic difficulty. 
And we all know what happened, of course, in 1818. Um, a man named J uh, Andrew Jackson came to Florida, or at least invaded Florida, and essentially created, uh, created uh, things or movements towards Florida being ceded to the United States. So, so basically the timing for Duval to leave Kentucky was pretty good. So what basically occurred is that Duval obviously is broke, he's in Kentucky, he's in Bardstown, and Calhoun essentially, who becomes Secretary of War in, in Monroe's administration, throws Duval a kind of lifeline. And of course, Monroe had known the family clearly anyway. There's no question that uh, Duval was known to, uh, to President Monroe. At any rate, through Calhoun's influence, um, Duval is appointed federal judge, um, one of the two federal judges in Florida, in the territory, and he'll come to St. Augustine, and then he will go back to Washington and begin doing what he did best, and that is lobbying. He began lobbying, like anything, for uh, an appointment as Florida's governor. Now, we, we all know that, 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 that uh, Jackson became Florida's first, technically first governor, but he was more of a commissioner, really, than a governor. He really didn't do really much at all other than receive the surrender from the Spanish. He never went anywhere but, but Pensacola, <clears throat> and he was only there three months. So, basically, um, Duval uh, became, was appointed the first real um, civil governor of Florida in 1822. Here's what Florida looked like in 1822. As you can see, St. John's County is about, uh, there's two counties, St. John's County um, and Escambia County. Um, and do, so Duval comes, returns to Florida as governor. He comes first to St. Augustine um, and he will actually preside over the first uh, legislative council. He is, as everyone knows, of course, was instrumental in selecting two individuals, um, John, uh, John Williams um, and, and Simmons, to come to Middle Florida to found a capital. Now, everybody pretty much understood where the most fertile territory for Florida was already by 1820, 1821. Everybody knew that this area between the Okalachne and the Suwannee Rivers was, had the potential, of course, of becoming, <clears throat> excuse me, an economic powerhouse um, and, and because of the fertility of the land. So it was pretty much understood that this is where this location would be. This is actually the first plat uh, of Tallahassee that Duval was very much involved in, in making. He actually had some experience um, in city planning because his father had, had designed a lot of uh, Richmond and he actually was city attorney or county attorney, I should say, of Nelson County, Kentucky. Here is actually his um, location of his residence. And of course, everyone knows where the Cascades are. Here is actually the Cascades here. And this is, um, this is actually the, um, uh, the location of his first house, which was really not much more than a log cabin at first. Okay, here's an image, of course, of the early, uh, uh, an image of the early um, uh, uh, location for the, for the um, first um, a meeting of the legislature. Here's some streets, of course, um, street scene. These are actually images. Both of these images are images of, of the Comte de Castle now, who was a French, French explorer, <clears throat> French traveler who traveled to Tallahassee and drew these images and wrote a lot about the, the, the social life of the place. Here's actually an official document um, which shows, which has a lot of officiality to it. Of course, this is a official document. It's actually an appointment. Um, Duval would have signed hundreds of these, these, um, of these documents uh, appointing. He had a very broad appointment power as his territorial governor. Well, at this point, I want to, um, to open it up to questions. I don't have any, um, not, not questions, but I want to ask a question. Um, I don't want, I don't have any prizes um, or anything like that, but does anybody know who this individual is? Anybody know who this individual is?
Oh, he looks familiar. Um, um. I'll give you a hint. Uh, there's more names of counties. Every state has a, has a blank county. Marquis um, de Lafayette. Yes, that, that's exactly the Marquis de Lafayette. Yeah. That's him. This is him as an old, well, not as an old man, but as an older man, obviously from the boy or the teenager, practically he was when he was in the American Revolution. And so the founding of Tallahassee coincided with one of the most exciting uh, events in early American history. And that is the visit of the Marquis de Lafayette to the United States. He's, he came and he visited here in 1824 um, to about the same time as Tallahassee was founded. Um, and he knew uh, Duval's father quite well from their service in the American Revolution. In fact, there's several letters between the two that I've, that I've discovered. Um, and he did not come to Tallahassee, but he came pretty much all the way from Georgia, all the way up to New York for sure. And he, 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 he spent a lot of time in Washington. And of course, we all know, of course, a lot about the Lafayette Township, the Lafayette Grant. Um, he was given, he was gifted this grant, this uh, township of land um, in, in, in commemoration of his service in the American Revolution, which would have been what, about 40 years earlier. Um, so how, why and how was this grant located where it was? I don't think there's any question that Duval's influence in this was, was quite clear. That is the location of this grant in the brand new uh, territorial um, uh, capital within the within the the broad outlines of the of, of the Florida capital um, did a tremendous amount to highlight the territory and to promote the territory, and really that this is where we go back and we bring in once again uh, William Wirtz and also and also Southard. William Wirt and also Southard because the Duval correspondence is full, um, is full of references to this Lafayette grant. Now, now Lafayette never came to Tallahassee, but he eventually sold off the land. And this is of course the, the way that he basically got his money. He hired an agent um, Robert Williams, who was of course a, a local leader in, in, in Florida in Tallahassee, who had connections with all the big money people in, 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 in Virginia and elsewhere. And pretty soon um, Duval is going to be essentially showing these people around, writing letters, uh, talking about the potential of the, of the land, et cetera. And with Southard, he's even gonna partially invest as well as a kind of silent partner in some of these lands. Um, so anyway, this is a kind of the connection with with the, with the Washington scene. Um, who is this individual? Who is this individual? Aquila Murat, isn't it? Yes, exactly. That's another connection that Duval Duval met Murat actually in Saint Augustine. Uh, Aquila Murat was the uh, nephew, actually, of a, of Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, he came to, to, as many other Napoleonic refugees came to America, he actually uh, came to St. Augustine. And Duval, of course, um, was, was very, very friendly with him um, and was, uh, and, 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 and this, of course, was the case. Um, this individual also is an important person in this group or this mix. Now, one of the most significant realities, of course, of territorial Florida is that Andrew Jackson, even though at this point when Tallahassee was founded or when the, when the territory began, he was only a senator. But by the time Tallahassee is founded, of course, he's going to run for president and nearly win. He also had a coterie of individuals around him that we call, we tend to call cronies. Andrew Jackson's cronies in Florida, of course, is the, the great um, article that, um, that Herbert Jarty from University of Florida wrote. And this is one of his individuals, his cronies. And this is James Gadsden. James Gadsden was a well-to-do um, man from uh, South Carolina, from Charleston. His father was quite well-to-do. His father was an American revolutionary hero. Um, he had, was in the army, as you can see here. And he fought with Jackson as, as well as Richard Keith Call. 
Uh, and he and Richard Keith Call and Duval and a couple of other individuals would actually turn out to really control things in Tallahassee and they would be known as the nucleus, the nucleus. They kind of controlled all the federal appointments um, even before Jackson came along, but once Jackson was elected president, they really did. And of course they were very much um, resented for this in some quarters. Well, we all know who this individual is. This is of course is Neomalta. And one of the great stories, which is kind of a legendary epic story, is Duval's confrontation with Neomalta. Neomalta, of course, was the Miccosukee chief who had actually lived in, the, in this area when Williams and, um, and um, Simmons came. Um, and he and Duval had kind of a, well, a, a really rough uh, relationship. Uh, Neomalta was, of course, a very large man, very charismatic person. Um, and he was persuaded by, by Gadsden and Duval and others to relocate or at least sign a treaty, the Treaty of Moultrie Creek, to relocate to a reservation here in the middle of Florida. This, is, this was the Treaty of Moultrie Creek, which was consummated in 18, uh, 1880, uh, 1823. And so that is going to be a sticking point because, well, Neomalta doesn't want to go and he won't go. Um, and there's a series of confrontations, which Washington Irving writes about and Duval liked to talk about, about how one day Duval basically just took him by the scruff of the neck and basically forced him to, to come to the realization that he had to leave, et cetera. And it's a big confrontation and so forth. Now, I'd heard about and read about all of these things, and I read Washington Irving's account. But the more I looked into it, um, I read, of course, the letters he wrote to Southard and to other people, to, to John Quincy Adams, who was president at the time. And they all tend to really pretty much verify this, uh, this confrontation. So it, it really became um, kind of interesting to follow um, um, Duval's life on the historical record and also uh, the Washington Irving side. Okay. Um, now, these four individuals, these four individuals, who can tell me who they are and why they are, uh, why they are in this box? Who can tell me where they are? Okay, the easy one is... Jackson. Jackson, right. Um, Henry Clay. Henry Clay. Sorry, I took, I took it out of your mouth, Ben. Okay. Is that John Quincy Adams? Adams? John Quincy Adams. Yeah. This, this is the hard one. Crawford? Yes. I'm impressed. Wow. Wow. Ben. That was Ben, right? I'm impressed. Yeah. Well, We're dramatizing this. So. <laughs> <laughs> why, why, are they, why are they pictured together, all four together? The corrupt bargain. Yes. The election of 1824. Andrew Jackson polls the majority of, 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 of popular votes, or at least the plurality, I should say. Um, and he gets a plurality of electoral votes, but he doesn't get an adequate number to put him over the top. I'm not sure, it wasn't 270, um, but, but, <laughs> but, but it was a certain number. So <laughs> election, like 1800, went to, into the House of Representatives. So in the House of Representatives, um, Clay drops out and basically supports Adams. Um, and of course, as Ben mentions, of course, or says it's the corrupt bargain. And here, of course, is, um, is the eventual winner. Um, but, and this is where Forrest Gump comes in. No, not Forrest Gump, but guess who was in the, in the, was in the gallery when, um, when Jackson was counted out, uh, watching in the House of Representatives Gallery. Guess what two individuals were sitting together um, in the, I guess you'd say the gallery, maybe you could say the grandstands, I'm not sure what, but guess who, guess what two individuals were sitting together watching Jackson get counted out? Governor Duval and his friend, the Marquis de Lafayette. They were both wow. sitting side by side. I found, actually found a newspaper 
item, one of those tiny little, little newspaper items um, in some obscure newspaper um, that actually saw, that actually mentioned that they were both sitting together watching the debates in the gallery as Jackson was counted out. Well, we all know, and here's Clay, of course. Um, we all know that, of course, this means that, that Duval, although he enjoys an appointment by John Quincy Adams, his enemy is going to be Secretary of State. Secretary of State really managed back then, um, did more in terms of domestic issues than he did foreign policy, really. He managed all the foreign policy or all the appointments of the various ter territories, judges, territorial governors. He was, of course, a kind of manager uh, of all of the federal appointees. So the fact that Clay was in that position really did not do Duval any good, that's for sure. And well, my, we it, my Secretary yeah. of State's position was really more of a stepping stone to the presidency in those yes. days than the vice presidency was. Yes. In fact, that's why the corrupt bargain, some argued, was so corrupt. Uh, or at least in the eyes of people, because if you go back, you look at who were who were the presidents. Um, um, uh, Jefferson was was Washington's Secretary of State. Madison was Jefferson's Secretary of State. Monroe was Madison's Secretary of State. Quincy was was Monroe's Secretary of State. So guess what? Is do we do we suspect that Clay is going to be the next president of the United States? Well, what people are thinking. Therefore, the corrupt bargain. Exactly. Well, from, we all know that from the very beginning of the next day of the election, um, Jackson and his supporters were outraged and began running uh, again. Now, um, Duval didn't know Jackson well until he became territorial governor, but he, he immediately became very friendly with Jackson. He knew that Jackson was really going places. Um, he knew that Jackson was eventually going to be president at some point. So basically, he tied his coattails to Jackson. No question about it. Um, and he vis visited the Hermitage often. He traveled all the time. He's always going back to Kentucky. He's always going to Washington. And he would always, of course, spend a week or two at the Hermitage and see, Washington, uh, see Jackson. Um, and throughout, from 1824 to 1828, he was really as, as out of Florida as often as he was in Florida. And where was he? He was primarily in Kentucky, um, running against Clay, or basically kind of building, of course, an anti-Clay um, anti um, movement in Kentucky. Um, and also, which, which would also mean an anti-John Quincy Adams movement. And again, remember, he is appointed by John Quincy Adams, but yet he is going to be, he is going to be campaigning and doing everything under the surface, of course, for Jackson's, Jackson's eventual election. He also meets this fellow. This fellow is um, John Eaton. Now, this is a very, very flattering younger picture of John Eaton, who was very close to Jackson. Everybody knows this story, of course, of Jackson and, and, um, and Eaton, of course, living in the boarding house, Peggy Eaton's um, boarding house, Peggy Eaton's father's boarding house. Um, this is Peggy Eaton, of course, the, the, the beautiful woman who Eaton, of course, becomes enraptured in love with and so forth. The only problem is she's married. Um, she's married to a naval officer who's always out of town, always at sea. Um, and so he, she, she and Eaton, of course, end up, of course, um, very much involved. And then when Jackson finally wins the White House in 1828, he tells Eaton to marry her, and he will make Eaton his Secretary of War. Well, here's an Im image, of course, of Jackson being entertained by Peggy. And, of course, you can see the other cabinet members just having a lot of fun. Well, the person you do not see in this picture of all the having fun is the Vice President of the United States. Hmm. Is the Vice President of the United States. John C. Calhoun. John C. Calhoun, exactly. Um, now, think about this from Duval's perspective. 1828, John C. Calhoun is Vice President. Andrew Jackson, his friend, is President. 
Andrew Jackson, when he was elected president, is a physical wreck. He's got two bullets, one in his lung and one in his shoulder. In fact, he's constantly coughing up blood from tuberculosis and from this bullet, which of course is lodged in his lung from one of his duels. He's sick every single day. He has every kind of malady you can imagine. He's over 60 years old. Jackson is a physical wreck. Everybody thinks that Jackson's gonna die. Um, and Calhoun is gonna be president. And even if Calhoun isn't president, Jackson is Duval's friend. But then Peggy Eaton comes in to wreck everything. Basically, we all know the story of Calhoun um, and Fluoride Calhoun, his wife, of course, banning Peggy from all events, of course, in the White House. And you can see all these other men. One of the men, of course, that's depicted here is the Secretary of State, Martin Van Buren. Martin Van Buren will, of course, use this uh, issue to alienate um, Calhoun from Jackson. And of course, the other thing that, Cal that Jackson learns simultaneously with this, um, his aggravation with Calhoun is the Florida affair um, letter, or at least the, uh, the, the reality that Calhoun wanted to, as Secretary of War, Calhoun wanted to court-martial Jackson. Now, Jackson didn't know this. Um, Jackson thought Calhoun was, well, oh, okay, and, you know, and everything, and, and he was not kind of a double dealer, but he soon learns through the offices of, we're not sure exactly who told him, um, but he learns that Calhoun, of course, is basically his enemy. So everything kind of is wrecked for Duval because Duval is right in the middle of this. What does he do? Does he support um, Jackson, who is against Calhoun um, and wants to vindicate Peggy, or does he, um, does he follow along with Calhoun? Well, here's a picture, of course, of, of Duval at the time. You can kind of see um, a little twinkle in his eye. You can just about to see he's about to tell you a funny story. Uh, I love this picture. It's really kind of an unknown picture. I actually got this picture from descendants in Texas um, of the family. Um, I like this picture a lot more, I, I guess, than the official picture that we're so used to seeing. Um, anyway, here's a picture of Richard Keith Call, which everyone knows. Um, and the other thing, of course, that, that created the break between Calhoun and Jackson was the nullification issue. And this, of course, is the, this is the toast that Ben, um, the ben, ben loves toast, right, Ben? Yes. Uh, this is the toast uh, at the Jefferson Day dinner. This is about the time of the Peggy Eaton affair. And Jackson is kind of throwing out the gauntlet here. Jackson is saying, our union, it must be preserved and Calhoun, who was known to support nullification and so forth, the controversial um, notion of, of, of nullification. And Jackson is kind of challenging Calhoun here. Um, the union next to our liberty most dear. Now, there are many, many toasts. Uh, if you look at the Washington National Intelligence, sir, there's about 30 printed toasts uh, in, the, in the newspaper. But one is not in there, and I think there that one of the people in there that was not recognized was actually Duval. I think Duval was actually in the room. I think I can place him actually in the room that night. Uh, and again, he could, he was there. If he was there, he would have understood the peril that he was in, in terms of, well, trying to figure out whether he was going to flip or fly. Um, here, of course, is a, just an example of some of the, um, the states' rights nullification ticket. This is actually from South Carolina, but this kind of shows us an image, of course, of this new party, in a sense, that is emerging, which is really going to cause Duval a lot of problems. Here is a, a map of this period, um, and of course, we can see the road that, that Duval would have traveled from St. Augustine to, uh, to Tallahassee any number of times. Um, and I have a couple of other images here that I want to show um, before I go back to um, Duval's last um, last few years as territorial governor. Now I'm 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 going to I'm, I'm I'm not going to talk about a lot of the Indian uh, issues, Indian affairs. But up to now, 
the Indian affairs have been pretty much, you know, tamped down pretty well. Um, but when Duval left office um, and, and left his governorship um, to this individual who was John Eaton, uh, and Pe John and Peggy actually come to Tallahassee. They come to Florida. And this is John Eaton a number of years later, of course, as governor of Florida, territorial governor of Florida. Um, the Indian situation is about to blow sky high. And we all know that Dade's massacre would occur about a, a year later. But I think it's accredited to Duval that he was able to keep the Indian affair issue really, um, really under control until he left. Here's a more contemporary picture <clears throat> of Washington Irving. And this is a period in which um, Duval and Washington Irving kind of, um, kind of repatriated themselves together. And they got, they, I have them um, in, in Washington or Philadelphia, I'm not sure, together for a few weeks. And I think this is the period about 1836 or so when, when Washington Irving really started getting serious about writing about Duval. Um, now, this map is a map of the Texas Revolution. And I mentioned, of course, that Duval was involved in all kinds of things. After he left uh, Tallahassee uh, from being a territorial governor, he went back to Kentucky. He tried to practice law up there, he tried to move up there and practice law. But it, when he got up there, he and his sons became involved in the Texas Revolution. His son, his, his, his fa favorite son was Burr Duval. Du Burr Duval led a group of volunteers all the way from Kentucky with his little brother, John C., John Crittenden, to Texas. And he fought in the Texas Revolution and was, of course, unfortunately among those massacred at the Battle of Goliad. Now, this, this event um, really was awful for Duval and his wife, of course, it broke their hearts. Um, his son was one of the only, his son, John Crittenden, was one of the only to escape this massacre. Um, but of course, Duval himself committed himself to the revolution, kind of commissioned general, um, but primarily from a, from a, um, from a recruiting standpoint. Um, after that, um, Duval, of course, um, became involved in the Tyler administration. He became an advisor. And he ended up, of course, uh, moving to Texas. And I think I'm probably running out of time here. This is, this is really kind of um, probably need to wrap things up here. Um, so I guess, um, well, he maintained his relationship with John C. Calhoun. And of course, um, was involved in Calhoun's um, um, 18 uh, Compromise of 1850 activities, um, and then actually ended up migrating to uh, Texas, and then of course uh, going to Washington, where he where he was a a, a kind of a lobbyist. Uh, he he was a lobbyist. So here is just some images of that. This is actually his uh, his him in yeah, Washington, and then here is um, Duval as an older individual. Um, and when he died in 1854 in Washington, he's actually buried in the Congressional Cemetery. And you can barely see the, the name etch, etched here. Um, just in the distance, uh, we see uh, the grave of Samuel Southard, who was also buried in the cemetery, as well as, well as William Worth. So I guess I'm just going to end it there um, and see if there's any questions. Mike, anybody that has any questions, please speak out. Mike, I'd like to start off by asking you, Jackson and Calhoun. Now, uh, Duval was friends with both of them. Yes. And they were not friends. Who? How? How ultimately did that? Did he have to choose between them? I mean, how did? Well, that it really, it really wrecked his career. Okay, um, because he he had to he had to kind of decide which is which. And remember, if you go to 1833 is when the big nullification crisis happened. It was one year before he left office. But even before that, it was clear that he and Washington, or he, had, he and Jackson had broken. So he, he, he really played the, the politician, the political politician here. He, Jackson was in power 
So he really did his, his best to accommodate Jackson. In fact, he even wrote a series of letters justifying Jackson's support of Peggy Eaton. And it's really kind of pathetic in, in some sense. Um, and he, and Calhoun, of course, kind of went into kind of oblivion to a certain extent. Well, he went back into the Senate um, and he and Calhoun kind of quit their correspondence. But then when Jackson died, Jackson died, of course, about 45 or so, um, he renewed his, 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 um, his relationship with Calhoun, and they were both old men at the time. And there's a lot of, there's actually a lot of letters that that took that crossed between both of them. Um, I didn't get a chance to talk about his his later years. He ran for Congress in 1848, um, and he was very much, of course, on Calhoun's side in terms of the sectional crisis. And really, as an old man, really kind of went off the deep end as a rabid. Uh, rabid secessionist. Um, I, th I think Duval had, was, was bipolar. Um, he was a extremely flamboyant, charismatic figure, but if you read his correspondence and there is, it's, it's bits and pieces, he really would, would, would become melancholy, extreme melancholia. Um, in the 1840s, he, 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 he went basically broke. He never really had much money. He had eight kids he had to support. Um, and in the 18, uh, late 1840s, he again ran for Congress and lost. Um, but he really kind of went back and renewed his relationship with Calhoun. And both of them became pretty bitter um, about things. Calhoun, of course, died in 1850 and, and, and Duval died in 1854. But he still had that 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 flair, that charisma, that 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 funny kind of persona. Um, he still had the reputation of being just somebody that everybody wanted to wanted to hang out with. And I, I mentioned to Bob before, my major professor at FSU, Bill Rogers, used to say that he categorized people into two 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 groups. One section are people that you really would want to go down to Panama City with. Um, on the weekend, and then another group who you would not want to go to Panama City with. Um, and Duval was clearly one of those Panama City traveling companions that would have been fun. Um, now Calhoun, forget it. Calhoun was grim. He was, he was, he was never very much um, very, he was a brilliant person, but he was really not at all um, very fun to be with. Um, when Duval died in 1851, the Nash Washington National Intelligencer, which was probably the leading political paper of the time, kind of like the Washington Post today, um, wrote of Duval, um, few, men, few men recounted his life in Virginia and Kentucky. Uh, I'm sorry, few men who have led such a varied life have left behind so pure and spotless a name. His public and integrity and ability with which he acquitted himself in his public trust were widely known. His dauntless courage, too, has been proven on various trying occasions. But it is among his intimates that his loss will be more especially lamented. Among those who delighted in his simple, unaffected goodness, his genial humor, his devoted and, un and unwavering friendship, and the kind of generous qualities of his heart, and the manly independence of his spirit, William Pope Duval, the commentator asserted, was a type of genuine American character. <laughs> a genuine American character. Um, certainly that was true of him. Um, and his, his, um, his personality, his um, tall tale telling, um, was, certainly a, um, was certainly something that, that separated him. But, but his, his, his friends, um, the Calhoun and Jackson um, fit really kind of did him in. What? Okay, any other My, questions? Whoops. Mike, I have a question. Yes. This image that's on the screen now of the obelisk. Where yes. is that, please? That's, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned, that's the Washington, the, uh, that's the Congressional Cemetery in Washington. Washington, D.C.? 
Yes, it's in Washington, oh, okay. D.C. That's where he's buried. And of course, um, very much in view, I think it's one of these gravestones behind him, is his friend, Samuel Southard, who died about four years earlier. And also William Wirtz is buried in the cemetery as well. Um, and it's, um, it's an interesting, really interesting place. And it took me quite some time to find, well, it didn't take me any time at all to find the, the obelisk. This obelisk, by the way, was put in place in 1925. I discovered that um, that uh, Senator Duncan Upshaw Fletcher in 1925 um, had this obelisk made. Um, mm. People of Florida actually put that put that in there. Now, um, many everybody of course has been to Key West, and everybody's been to Duval Street, but also in Key West is Southard Street and also um, Eaton Street. Now, Southard Street is pretty pretty obvious because Southard was Secretary of the Navy during the time that, that Key West really was, was um, developed by the United States. So that was a natural, uh, that was a natural, you know, natural name. Mike, I'm, Go ahead, sir. Yes. Mike, I'm interested in the picture that you showed of Peggy Eaton entertaining yes. the cap. Yeah, isn't that great? Yeah, it, it, he, he seems to be dancing <laughs> on point. Yes. <laughs> now this is actually an engraving um, of the time. Uh, it was actually in a publication. I'm not sure where it originally appeared, um, but I think this is actually a contemporary engraving. Um, and you know, we all know about the psychological Con concept of project is it pro projection or displacement? I'm not sure. I don't think there's any question that that Jackson saw in Peggy Eaton uh, the wronged woman, the kind of uh, image, of course, of Rachel. Everybody knows the story of Rachel. Rachel, of course, was um, destroyed. Really, her character was destroyed. She was accused of being an adulteress, and of course, there was this this issue of she and Jackson not being properly married. You know, and and all that. And I don't think there's any question that Jackson um, just kind of lobbed on to Peggy. She was obviously beautiful. She was obviously young, but I think she reminded him of Rachel and the, the, the arrows and slings and arrows that were thrown at Rachel. Because remember, when Jackson was elected um, from in November to the time he was inaugurated in March, Rachel died. So he comes to Washington in mourning um, he was, of course, a broken man, psychologically and physically. He was in mourning. Uh, his life, the, the love of his life, Rachel, had died. He, he held, of course, the, his opponents, his political opponents, guilt, guilty for that. Um, he, he was practically, a, he, was a, he practically had a nervous breakdown. Um, and then here's Peggy, of course, who was being, you know, wronged by these, by these enemies of Jackson and so forth. So I think there's there's a lot of connection there. There's it, it's just kind of a you know human nature kind of situation. And of course, <laughs> now I can't vouch for this picture, Ben. This picture actually is on a cigar box. <laughs> <laughs> Believe it or not, here is, um, and I just saw this picture recently. Most uh, pictures of Peggy Eaton um, have her as an older woman, and even though you can see. Her beauty supposedly she was the most beautiful woman you know in Washington the kind of and the kind of woman that all men loved but all women hated because she was so popular and so precocious and she was the life of every party and all the men of course just went attracted by her and all that kind of stuff so she and she was of course somebody that just didn't keep quiet like you're supposed to didn't behave like you're supposed to as a woman of course and at that time and so she would, she, she, she did, she destroyed um, the wash, the uh, Jackson cabinet, no, no doubt about it. Nice. You, I wanted to ask a question about uh, yes. E.G. Allman and his uh, writing about the untoward effect of uh, Washington Irving on early popular historians in Florida and some of the mythologies that were propagated. Do you have some thoughts on that? Well, 
Well, I know TD. Uh, I know TD. I actually had him speak at my college, um, and but uh, he's 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 really not a historian. He's a he's a polemicist. He's a he's a he's a magazine long long style magazine writer, you know, and his book is um, is really not that reliable when it comes to to, to history. He, he really did. He really um, he really, I think, was unfair to a lot of the people he writes about. It's one of those heroes and villains books. Um, everybody's corrupt, except maybe one of the people he likes, that kind of thing. Um, but I think he got a lot of the early stuff wrong. Um, and this, this, his book came out um, a little bit before mine did. And, and I actually uh, read it um, in manuscript. And we, we, we just disagree a lot on, on our approach to, to Duval particularly. Um, Duval was a kind of an operator, no doubt about it. He was kind of a slick character. He was accused of a lot of wrongdoings. He was kind of, um, uh, I guess, in our modern day parlance, a flip-flopper, actually. He, he, <laughs> he, he, he was a member of the Democratic Party, then he went with the Whigs for a while, then he went back to the Democrats. Um, you know, the Jackson Calhoun thing, and it caught him kind of, kind of crossways. Um, but, you know, there's no question that, that uh, Washington Irving's stories which are basically right out of Duval's mouth, essentially as tall tales. Now Duval never, I, um, never really expected that Irving would um, would would print any of this stuff. Duval told these stories all over the place. They were kind of like fun stories. Um, I wish I had. I have. I, can, I don't think I can find it right now. But I have a quote of of John Crittenden Duval, um, who is. William Pope Duval's son, John Crittenden Duval, who survived the, the massacre at Goliad that his brother was killed in, who was one of the only survivors, he ended up becoming a incredible writer. Um, and he is known as the first Texas man of letters. He wrote all of these um, great, uh, great stories of, of <laughs> frontier and so forth. No. Uh, and um, um, Crittenden uh, John Crittenden talks about how, how his father was very angry when um, when uh, the um, the crayon papers came out um, that he never intended for any of those stories to be in print um, and it really and it really kind of damaged him politically because when those when those stories came out in 1840 they actually came out in 1840 it damaged his political um, his political aspirations now he's an older guy um, but he does serve in the, in the, um, in the state legislature, but he runs for Congress in 1848 and he really takes a lot of heat for, um, for, for the, um, the, uh, the Ralph Wingwood tales, which is, he's, he's supposedly Ralph Wingwood, the character Ralph Wingwood. So, um, he's really kind of, um, damaged by that and he really kind of resents it but as his son says that um that washington irving kind of did that without his approval and kind of snuck around doing it and he was really kind of tick ticked about it mike several years ago um the political commentator john meacham wrote a book mm -hmm. about, oh, andrew, yeah. about andrew jackson in the white house in which he yeah. he postured he he's he, he postulate. I used, it, I used it a lot in the book, by the way. Well, I'd, I'd like to have your thoughts about it, because among the things he he, he posits in there is that during the Eaton affair, John Eaton offered to resign from the cabinet, and Jackson wouldn't let him. And one of his, one of Beecham's theories is that if Jackson had let Eaton leave, when he wanted to, then the, then the falling out with Calhoun would not have happened. And Calhoun mm -hmm. might have stuck around and, and mm -hmm. eventually become president. And I'd, I'd like your mm -hmm. thoughts about that. I mean, I don't really, I don't really have a, I don't really have. Um, I, I think I've had a figure of 15 minutes. I don't really have a comment on that. It's just um, minus five. But I did get a lot. Yeah. I did get a lot of um, information out of um, out of his book, particularly about um, um, heavy news. Eaton's, 
and this is the, um, it is yeah conflicts and and fighting you know and and trying to kill uh, oh, was it Ingram who was a member of the cabinet yeah <clears throat> I don't know I didn't really get around to this so somebody needs to mute you have uh, any other questions any other questions well, let me just, see if uh, I can, uh, let me see if I go ahead let me see if I can find that 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 um that statement uh, that is that um, um, that John Crittenden talked about uh, about the Irving relationship. That was a by the way, that was a really really thorny, difficult thing to sort out. Uh, was 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 Irving's um, mm -hmm. was the relationship between the two of them because it obviously was was pretty pretty long term. And it, it, it was strong in some periods and then for a while it would go away. But then, um, but then there would be um, periods where they would be together and that kind of thing. So, yeah. I wanted to ask one question. The, the Duval house is traditionally placed where the tennis courts are now at Myers Park. Do you... Do you have any thoughts or ideas about that? Whether yes, I think it is. I think that's exactly where it is. Um, um, everybody in the room I, I know knows Joe Kanetch, um, and Joe, Joe and I remember I, uh, when I was working on the book. Joe and I went to kind of trace out what we thought where it was, and and I think I think it is the tennis courts. But on, but I think it would have been the highest point. It would have been the highest point in that in that direct area. The tennis courts are kind of high, but of course behind that hedge, if you go across the little street there, behind the hedge, uh, the big hedge is a, is a hole, I don't know what, what hole it is, of the Tallahassee Country Club. <laughs> that hole is a little, that, that green for the hole is a little higher. If you go, if you look through the hedge, <laughs> you can see, you can see the green, um, and that is a little higher, and that I think is a, is the very highest point. So it might be behind that hedge where the green is, or again, it might be the uh, the tennis court as well, which is only about a hundred feet from there. So, right. so I, I think that's absolutely where it is. And um, yeah, you can just um, it, it's it's interesting if when you when you go to these places. When I went there, I could just kind of feel it, you know. Uh, I can just kind of feel this is this is probably where it was. And wouldn't it have been amazing to see that cascade uh, in its original state? Wouldn't that have been amazing to see that? Yeah. That's yeah. Like. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'd like to thank Mike for joining us tonight. We too, we we too have an official Tallahassee Historical Society travel mug for him that that uh, that we will that we will get to him and Ben, by the way, for for uh, for winning the trivia contest. Um, thank everybody for joining us tonight. We will be back here on January. I think it's January the fourteenth. I'll have to double check that. But our speaker will be will be Dr. Andrew Frank from um, from FSU, um, and and uh, we hope everybody can join us. I found it. I found it, Bob. Let me read All this. Right, don't leave. Don't leave. He yeah, found, I it. found it. This is uh, this is his son talking about the the, the Irving relationship here. Okay, um, and I go into how um, the Union Bank. Another problem for Duval was he. And I didn't mention this. We all know that the the, the catastrophe, the economic catastrophe for Tallahassee was the Union Bank of Florida. Now he had he had vetoed bank after bank bill after bank bill after bank bill. But is in his last year as governor, <laughs> he's basically kind of overwhelmed, and he signed the Union Bank line into law. And of course, after that, it, everything kind of well within within five or six years, the, the thing went down. So this will this will give us the context. When the bank crashed and burned, Duval handed a bludgeon to his opponents with which they could hammer him. It was about that time in 1840 when Washington Irving first published his stories about Duval. 
Duval's son, John Crittenden, remembered some years later that although his father had a, was a great admirer of Irving and they were warm personal friends, I do not believe he ever fully forgave him for putting these things in print. <laughs> <laughs> It seems that Irving had skillfully drawn him out, and he used that quote, skillfully drawn him out on, on convivial occasions without taking the least suspicion, without the least suspicion on the governor's part for the express purpose of, quote, taking notes. God. <laughs> John couldn't remember that while his father relished more than anything recounting his personal experience for some the amusement of his friends and his acquaintances, he had no desire at all to see them figuring in print. Son, Duval eventually came to the conclusion that authors consider themselves a privileged set and had an acknowledged right to make, to make use professionally of any material that might aid in catering to the public. So anyway. We thank okay. you very much. We thank you very much for joining us tonight. And uh, well, I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity. And um, I know I went really, really long. Um, and I apologize for that. We won't wait another 40 years to have you back. How about that? Okay, great. Well, maybe I can talk about the last half next time, perhaps. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll see everybody. We'll see everybody in January. Thank you very much. Have a night. Have a happy Christmas and happy holidays. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Happy holidays.